Okay, great. Well, this is going to be a, 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 a very intimate group here this evening. Um, but I do want to uh, wish you a good evening. And um, let me grab some of my glasses so I can read my notes. I want to welcome you to the first event of a new series here at RIT titled Entrepreneurship for Creatives. Our topic tonight is what are you worth? My name is Steve Brookstein and I will be your host and moderator this evening. I am an RIT adjunct professor teaching and coaching at the Simone Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's panelists, starting with two of your esteemed professors here at RIT's College of Art and Design. On the end is Peter Pincus, an accomplished ceramic artist and educator. His work has been exhibited in too many venues to name, and his ceramics have been found in numerous private and public collections, including the Dom Museum of Contemporary Art and the Schein Joseph International Museum. Peter is a 2017 Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award recipient. Seated next to Peter is Gary Jacobs, an architectural illustrator and environment concept artist. He has owned and operated his company, Jacobs Illustration, for over 15 years. Among his many projects, ranging from theme park attractions and public architectural spaces, Gary recently did the design work for the new canopy at the Greater Rochester International Airport. And I must say, it's a must see if you haven't seen it already. And now I am honored to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Natalie Siniscali. My notes say she's the one next to Gary, but I think she's here. <laughs> so you may want to come up here. <laughs> I, I promised Natalie that I would do my best not to make her blush, but I'm afraid that's going to be hard not to do. Natalie Siniscali is an international award-winning photographer, Athena Award Young Professional finalist, and the Knotts Best of Weddings Award winner five years in a row, which is awarded to the top 3% of wedding, prof wedding professionals nationally. As the owner of Natalie Sin Siniscali Photography for the past 12 years, she has risen to the top tier of wedding and portrait photographers here in Rochester. Her studio is located in downtown Rochester, where she employs a studio manager, a team of associate photographers, and editors. She hosts biannual fundraisers benefiting local charities that support social equality in our city. She has, photograph she has photographed stars such as Michael Keaton, Michael Douglas, and next month, Julia Roberts. Natalie has recently started a new business, Embolden, the goal of which is to help female entrepreneurs excel in business. Natalie is a champion for women and creatives alike. And oh yeah, she's a graduate of RIT. So with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Natalie back to RIT, and I yield the podium to you. Have you ever achieved a goal that you'd set out to achieve? only to find that life on the other side of that achievement was not what you thought it would be? For me, that goal was achieving technical proficiency in photography and even mastery. What I would say now, knowing what I've learned in my past 12 years, is that it's your ability to create impact with your skill that is more important than simply achieving mastery of your skill alone. Perhaps traditional thinking in how to become a valued artist and create worth as an artist are more focused on the path instead of the actual end goal. 
So where did this idea that skill is the most important thing to pursue when becoming an artist, where did that idea come from? In my schooling, going to school, um, you are graded and tested on how well you perform a task. So when I was in school, I would study my vocabulary words, I would take a quiz, and I would get an A if I had practiced them well enough. I made a solar system project out of foam spheres that would have Copernicus in awe, and I got an A. My time at RIT was no different. I sat through crit critiques with my professors and peers, and my skill was compared against the skill of my classmates. The culture amongst the photography school was basically that the better photographer you were, the more opportunities you would have, and you would ultimately become more successful in life. Skill seemed to be the only currency that mattered. I had accepted that if I wanted to become a valued artist, that skill was the only thing worth pursuing. And when I decided to start my business in 2007, with no bu business training or any other alternate messages to teach me how to start a business, I assumed that the same principles would apply, that skill would be rewarded with success in business. So fast forward three years after I have started my business. I felt like I'd made it. I had lots of clients that loved me. I was winning awards for my photography and even a silver medal in an international print competition in Las Vegas. I had hundreds of clients and I was, it, from the outside, I looked very successful. I had a studio in, the, pit, in um, the village of Pittsburgh and I even had someone answering my phone. So it had seemed like I'd made it. The reality? I was miserable. So I had spent the past three years investing every minute and dollar I had into becoming the best photographer that I could be. I had about $1,000 in my bank account, and I was on the verge of either going out of business or insane, whichever one came first. <laughs> um, I, I loved what I did, and I, I still loved my craft, and I was proud of it, but I was incredibly burned out. I was ill, um, I wasn't sleeping or resting, it had cost me my social life, um, my health, and as I mentioned, basically all of my money. <laughs> um, and I was actually no closer to having a successful career in photography than I had been basically when I started. And I was still confused as to how I could get out of that situation. I remember really clearly thinking, should I try to take better photos? <laughs> um, it's funny now, but at the time there was no humor in this. <laughs> um, so I was basically confused as to why money had magically appeared in my bank account due to my ability to take good photos. The mistake was in my thinking, thinking that my core value was determined by my skill alone. The lesson that I needed came in the form of a single client. There was a woman I had done headshots for, um, and when the time came, she got engaged, and she needed to book a wedding photographer. So she gave me a call. I sat down with her and her fiancé to talk about my wedding photography packages. Um, ultimately, her and her fiancé decided to go with another photographer because I wasn't going to fit into their budget, and we went our separate ways. I didn't think anything of it. About a year later, my phone rang. It was 8 a.m., so I was sleeping. Um, and when I answered the phone, there was someone sobbing on the other end of it. And I was alarmed because you don't call a photographer in case of an emergency. Um, so, <laughs> so I, I got out of her, you know, I was like, what, what's going on? And she said, I just received my engagement photos and they're absolutely horrible. I hate them. I'm so upset. Um, I, I'm definitely need to find a new wedding photographer and I want to redo these photos, are you still available for my date? So by chance, I happen to still be available. And so he said, why don't you come in later today and we'll, we'll talk things through and we'll, we'll make it official. So she came in, she was so excited that I was available for her date. And as we were formalizing um, me taking over her wedding photography, I asked to see the photos that she hated so much, mostly because I was really curious and 
I, I want to see how they looked. And so she was super excited to show them to me because she was craving the validation. She just couldn't wait for me to agree with her. Um, so she, she pulled out her laptop and we sat down next to each other. And one by one, she started clicking through the engagement photos. And I was absolutely awestruck. They were phenomenal. Beautiful photos, photos that I would have been proud to have in my portfolio. So I did what anyone would do, lied, um, said, oh my gosh, yeah, these are horrible. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, I'm freaking out, completely panicked, thinking, oh my gosh, if this is what I'm being held up against, you know, if, if she's going to be carrying, comparing the photos that I take to these photos, how am I going to be able to compete? I think these are great photos. And so then, simply to change the subject, I said, well, tell me about the shoot, as we're clicking through. And so she explains to me that um, the shoot was really stressful. She didn't feel like the photographer was really paying attention to her and her fiance. Um, she felt like her hair was always in the wrong place. Um, she wasn't allowed to bring her dogs on the shoot. Uh, she even recounted an argument that the photographer had with her assistant during the shoot itself. And she basically said that the photographer was more interested in their camera and their equipment than her and her fiance. And that's when I realized the message here. It wasn't about the photos. It was how the photos made her feel. So she actually hated these photos before she even saw them. So that lesson was invaluable to me. I did end up doing an engagement session for her. It was a very nice engagement session. Nothing that would win any awards, but the experience I provided her and her fiance was award-winning. I made them feel special. I took time, I played with her dogs, I made sure that her hair was in the right place, and I brought uh, an element of fun and spontaneity to the shoot, and ultimately that is what they remember, that feeling when they see their photos. So for them, the photographs are simply a reminder of the positive feeling that they had while they were being photographed. If you choose to be an artist, it's almost inevitable that you will ultimately work for yourself in some capacity. You will become the owner, the talent, and the promoter of your own business. I remember when I started my business, I had this really funny idea that I wasn't running a real business, I was running an art business. And those things seemed very different to me because I was an artist and that meant something. Um, I'd love to take this opportunity right now to tell you that you don't get to run a special business because you're an artist. And if you believe that a freelancer is not a business owner, I'm gonna burst the bubble right now. Same thing. You are running a business in which your skill and service and talent is the product. So I, at the time, I decided to hire a business coach who set me straight on quite a few things. Um, he pointed out that there's nothing glamorous about being a starving artist and that by going out of business because I don't know how to run a business, I wouldn't ultimately be able to provide any value to anyone and it wouldn't do anyone a favor by me not spending time and energy running this business properly. I had basically been running my business like a talent show instead of a business. And so I'd love to share five lessons with you that I learned on how to correctly improve your value and worth as an artist. Evoke feeling. Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, they will forget what you've done, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Good art should evoke feeling and provoke thought in the viewer. And if you, are think, if you want to sell art, you should be focused on creating an experience and a feeling that people will want to relive time and time again. Think of an influential person in your life. I would guess that they make you feel something about yourself, either positively or negatively. Perhaps they make you feel strong or empowered, or perhaps they make you want to prove them wrong. 
but they're influential in your life because they provoke feeling and thought. Good art should do the same. Develop your perspective of the world. You may not know what your goal or mission in life is yet, and that's okay. You will develop your perspective of the world and how it can be a better place as you grow as an individual. Now is the time to sharpen your tools while you're learning what that is. For me, my calling is to empower women, but I didn't know that for the first six years of my business. So what I would recommend to you is spend time developing this unique view of the world and ultimately realize that that is what will bring substance and value to the art that you create. Communication. There are very few career paths in which you can excel in isolation. In many cases, your success will be determined by your ability to communicate with others, either through building a team to execute your work, or if you're running a business, to communicate with your clients. Very Many of the artists that you love and, and know did not make their work alone. They are having a team of people either cast their statues or develop their photographs. And so frequently your success will be limited by your ability to communicate your ideas and your vision to others. Constant evolution. So my motto in business is innovate or die. It's dramatic, I know. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I started, I remember thinking that I would get to a place where I had made it. I thought at some point I would feel comfortable in business and know that I knew everything I needed to know to succeed. And that would be when I could just sort of sit back and relax and enjoy the process coast a little bit and just, you know, success would just come to me electively, easily, all the time. That doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> I've been in business for 12 years and it's a hustle every day. Um, I frequently describe to my team, I wake up like people are chasing me. Like it's, it's time and the more that you build, the more reputation, the more that you have to lose. And so it's a constant evolution. Things are constantly changing and it's important that you invest in yourself as you go and become a lifelong learner. Branding and marketing, vital to becoming a business owner or an artist. So if you don't believe in yourself, why should anyone else believe in you? I've referred to myself as a phenomenal photographer like four times in this presentation. And none of you hate me for it. In fact, you're starting to believe it. <laughs> So I would recommend that you, you know, kind of check your modesty at the door a little bit um, and make sure that you are stepping up to convey your value to the world and that you're able to communicate and share that. Branding and marketing is simply a megaphone that you use to announce your work and yourself to the world. Um, and branding is, is the essence of who you are and what you bring to the table. So it's very important to invest in that and develop that alongside your skill as an artist. Edison said that vision without execution is hallucination. And so I believe it's your job as an artist to create space and demand for your art in the world. I'm not saying that excellence in your craft is not worth pursuing. It certainly is. And I imagine that that's the message that you've received here at RIT. I would never say that my aptitude for photography has not contributed to my success as a photographer. And you are graduating from one of the best art schools in the world. That gives you incredible advantage that many artists could only dream of. But I want you to know that it's not enough. Your skill will not be the single ingredient to your success. The fact that I see every individual as beautiful is actually my greatest asset as a photographer. With my skill, I'm able to show that back to people, my vision of how I see them. So photography is not what I do, it's how I do what I do. 
And so my challenge to you is this. Fearlessly develop your vision for a better world and your unique perspective, who you are. Think of your art as the medium through which you share this with the world and take this opportunity you have now to sharpen all of the tools that you will need to create the better world that you envision. Thank you. Great, thank you, Natalie. So why don't you join us? So what we're gonna do is um, have a pretty informal conversation. Uh, I'm gonna get Gary and Peter involved in the, in the dialogue, but we're gonna talk among ourselves, well, share with you our thoughts, uh, and then we'll leave a little time for Q&A. So um, you know, keep in your mind and be thinking about what questions you might wanna ask um, Natalie, Gary, and Peter. I'm just the, the, the moderator here, but um, I'll start out by, um, you know, Natalie mentioned, and I'll start with Peter and Gary, get you involved in the, in the discussion here. It's interesting, I thought, the way Natalie described the difference between an artistic business versus a real business. Um, and you as creatives and artists, how does that resonate with you, and, and what, how do you see that distinction uh, as expressed by Natalie? We'll start with uh, Gary, you, you got the mic up. You? I think you've got to turn it on. On. Hello. Okay. Do you think you're in a real business or an artistic business? Both. Is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? I think the only difference between uh, a real business and an artistic business, if you will, is a CPA. It's like the only difference. A certified public accountant. You have a CPA? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. I think that that that. Well, and and of course, my perspective is based on the fact that I'm, I work in the field of craft. I make pottery, that's, my, that's what I do. Um, and, I, and, and in my field, uh, I, I think that people really struggle um, from differentiating what they do and what they know from what needs to get done. People who have CPAs know that they need to let certain things go and they need to allow other professionals to help them run their business. And those people tend to be running a real business. What do you think, sir? <laughs> so I, I struggle with it because uh, fr on the opposite end, I don't. Uh, I struggle with not being considered an, an artistic business per se, because a lot of my clients are architects and engineers, um, and the the idea of what I'm selling them is really story. So it's about being able to convey the intangible in what you could do in this space. So in the concept art that we're doing, it's like we're, it's not just an illustration of what's gonna be built. It's more than that. And I'm struggling, I struggle a lot with the opposite side to say, you know, um, it's not just mechanical engineering, it's not just architecture, it's how people live. And it's about conveying, okay, this is just the tool that I use. But what I'm doing is I'm conveying a story of how you're going to be in this space, you know? And that's, uh, it's those intangibles that are hard to build, if you will. It's, right, right, it's, right. It's, so I'll always have clients that are like, well, if, the, if I, I just bought the software, I could do this for me. That's specific. It's not going to be for you because you, you never, but it's, it's saying, no, what I actually offer is bigger than um, just the software. It's the story and the experience um, that you're telling and the mood. And it's like, you may, you may think, somebody m may say, um, the worth, your worth isn't your equipment, right? It's like, you would say, if you had a client say, why would I pay you? I could just buy a camera. You'd probably not want to work with that client. No, I <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Here's your camera. Make so sure you have to turn sure on. <laughs> you have to tell clients. It's like, yeah, you absolutely can do that. Go buy the software and try this. Because I, I may not, you may, we not may not have a great relationship going exactly. forward because of that, mm -hmm. and that may not be the client relationship that I want. So I'm actually coming at it from the other end, where I'm like trying to convey the abstraction of what I do 
it's too commercial of a business. So, like, they come from dollars and cents. They're like, can I make money from hiring you to do this, to do this concept? And I have to basically say that the art is worth that extra $10 million for the project or $30 million. You're going to raise $30 million more for this project if you can tell a story in how it's going to be used, you know? Yeah, but, uh, you know... That thought had not occurred to me, dude, in the words of Mr. Lebowski. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, because I can't, I can't put myself in your shoes, even though we have both have these creative businesses, because I would be the person that people would say, he w he's a starving artist, you know, th what mm -hmm. she said earlier, um, such as she is. So I, I think that for me, I, it would never be taken for granted that the business would be artistic in nature. And so we're coming at it from the other side where where, well, yeah, it, 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 an artistic business can be a real business. The only differentiation is order and organization. Yeah. So, so Natalie, how do you referee this, th this <laughs> Yeah, this no, this is fascinating. And I think the key differenti differentiation between your two experiences is your audience and what their preconceived thoughts are of what you do and also what they're hiring you for. What niche do they need you to fill for them? My business, I would say, is squarely in the center of both of them because I, I've had both experiences where, um, you know, perhaps a client who is not trusting me as a creative, you know, uh, thinker, they might say, okay, I want photos in front of this and this and this, and I want my photos here, and I'm going to wear this. And then on the other side of it, um, I think some people are surprised that I like, run a business or that I charge for my work. Um, which is crazy, but sometimes people will, you know, I, as an artist, they'll go, oh, like, um, this is a great opportunity for you to build your portfolio. And I know a lot of people, and I can, you know, send them to you. And I'm like, your friends that. won't want to pay me either. It would be, it'd be <laughs> perfect. Um, yeah. so, so it's interesting. And I think it all comes down to communication and positioning and how you talk about yourself and how the website if, you, if you're using your website as your main form of communication, how you educate your clients to regard you before they even get to you. And yeah. so it's, it's very much about that. And so yeah. if I have someone who's trying to micromanage me as a creative artist, I'll say, thank you for your input. I, I appreciate that. Um, here's my vision for your shoot. And so once I'm able to sell that to them, it's one of two things. They either d are not interested anymore and we part ways and that's fine. Um, or they, they get on board and go, oh, you're good at this. And I go, yes. And then we have a really good relationship moving forward. Um, but I, I think it, it, a lot of it has to do with education and what you prepare people to expect from you. Great. So I, I want to come back to value. And um, you were saying in your remarks, and we were chatting beforehand, that uh, it's not about the skills. It's, it's how you, the experience that you provide. Uh, and you were, you were mentioning that the importance, it's not the skills, it's the impact. Uh, and then the question is, well, how do you value impact? How do you measure impact? In dollars? Well, no, I, you, 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 you tell me. <laughs> is that what you I mean? mean? <laughs> no, no, I mean, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, I, well, that's part of it. Or I guess I would ask you, is that the sum of it or is it more? So I'll, I'll throw that to you and, and then you guys think about that. But how do you value and measure impact? Mm -hmm. And then, well, I'll just leave it at that. And I think, um, Gary, what you said to how do you charge for that intangible, the like creative fee? Mm -hmm. And people are like, what is this? Can we cross this one out? Because um, <laughs> they, they know what everything else is on the, the item, itemized invoice. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a tricky thing. And yeah. as someone who helps coach others in business, the very first and most pressing question I always get is, how do I price myself? Um, there's no easy answer. If there was, we wouldn't be having, this wouldn't be an interesting question, exactly. um, which it is very much. So I think a lot of it has to come down to, um, you know, certainly it's one, one way to attack the problem is to start with your expenses and say, okay, um, you know, how much is it going to cost me to create this? And then you could either approach it from, well, how much money do I want to make in a year to do this? And then divide that out by the number of jobs that you can commit to. Um, or the way that I do it is to get an idea of what the market will hold. I mean, it changes in every industry. 
Um, and without being greedy or you know trying to get as much out of people as you can, just get a sense for how much impact you're really creating in their life. How many, how many problems are you solving? Um, what would it cost to hire someone else to solve this problem for them? And then maybe somewhere in the middle. It is very tricky. We wouldn't be having this panel yeah. if it were easy. <laughs> so if somebody was to Google my work and call me for a job, I would say there's probably a 1% chance I want to do that job. Mm -hmm. And so I gauge my value based on my referrals because yes. I already I don't I don't have to build in this uh, education yeah. of my clients. They refer me to my other to their people mm -hmm. and I go and it goes back and forth and they're educating my value through referrals. Mm -hmm. You're saying you got to work this is this is the person to work with and when I when somebody Google's me, even hits my website, or even I'm really bad at social networking. Like that's I don't do any sort of social networking, and it, and it's because th my value is really hard to convey in social network. Mm -hmm. So my value is in the interpersonal relationship, mm -hmm. and so my referrals are like my best thing. Like nobody's gonna be able to hit me on Instagram and be like, yeah, that's what that's that's what that's worth. Um, so that goes to uh, how do I uh, deal with a client where it's educating them of my value up front? Mm -hmm. And I've had really hard conversations when somebody comes to me cold and says, what? Like when you say, when you give them a number and they're like, wow, that was mm -hmm. way more than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. And it's because they're not understanding the real value of mm -hmm. what you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. and that's hard. Mm -hmm. I think this, uh, this conversation has drifted somewhat from impact to value. Oh. So I'm going to see if I can't bring it back. Sure, my, uh, sure. My cousin, Brandon Thorpe. So he, he has this maple Thorpe. syrup. Maple uh, Thorpe? Not maple Thorpe. Thorpe. Uh, so uh, he started this maple syrup company where they, they tap the trees and they make this maple syrup. And, and then at the end of the year, they yield a certain amount. They sell it and they, they're part of the maple syrup distribution in, in Ithaca. And so I tried so to talk to him about how to build the business. And he said, well, this is, you know, how much does this stuff cost? And he told me how much the maple syrup costs. I said, you have the whole thing wrong. And he said, Peter, you have to understand there's a, a collection of people and there's a, an agreed upon price that can't get below this price for maple syrup so that no one's undercutting anyone else. And I said, you, it's the you, you're charging two dollars right now. It needs to be two hundred dollars <laughs> right now. And for the first year, you can't sell any of it. What you have to do is have a party, and you need to ex you need to take this maple syrup. Get and You hot. need to <laughs> let people know why this maple syrup will literally change the world. And then you need to start selling it for two hundred dollars. And he was like, "This is the silliest thing I've ever heard." And 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 I come from this field that. Uh, it has a tremendous um, skill uh, for undervaluing itself. Mm. Um, and uh, that the greatest impact one can make is to change any sort of structure for which the world perceives their, um, their uh, creative intentions, their field, whatever you want to call it. So, so for me, that, that notion of how something is, is uh, uh, priced how the world views it, how the world sees a cup and says that cup is $18 or it's $1,800. You know, that means that's impact. Mm -hmm. That is value and impact. And, and I would argue that $200 maple syrup tastes better than $2 maple syrup. Have you ever had some? Because I know where you can get it. Yeah. <laughs> right. but, La ladies but, and gentlemen, but, this is your introduction right. to business and yeah. marketing. But, 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 but I would ask. By uh, Thorpe. But I would ask. Does does a Rolex watch keep time better than a Timex watch? But, but keeping time is not the point of a Rolex watch. That's your, that's the point. Yes. So the right. value and the impact the, of that is exactly. the social currency. Right. So let's talk. Let's go back. One of your lessons was about branding and marketing, and that's that's actually an area I'm a little familiar with. Having we're throwing it to Peter now. Yeah, <laughs> I will. I'll throw it to Peter. So I mean, I've I've done branding and marketing for consumer product goods. I've 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 worked on Maxwell House coffee, Pringles, potato chips. HBO, adult diapers. I mean, I, I know about branding and marketing, but I know nothing about branding and marketing, creative 
and the intangibles around that. So, Peter, you have beautiful work. You have beautiful work. How, how do you brand it, if you brand it at all, and how do you market such, uh, again, this, this notion of, you know, how, how do you put, uh, uh, not, not so much the pricing of it, but the value, it's, well, it's art, so, you know, art is in the eyes of the beholder. How do you brand a market? And I would like to hear from the other two. If we're going to commission a, a, a Peter Pincus piece, I mean, where do we go? It's going to be right here. How do we know? There's got to be a there's got to be a starting point for the maple syrup holder. Well, branding branding is a very naughty word, and so when we established this uh, this uh, lecture series that we're now currently sitting in, uh, you know, I I sat there with Richard and I const I said time and time again we need to just talk about branding because to the people in the College of Art and Design, branding is it's just a it, it feels slimy when in fact it just is. It, it, it exists. <laughs> well, it's well, just something that exists. So I, whether I like it or not, have a brand. And my brand uh, has to do with making vessels in the 21st century when they were actually um, kind of on the decline in the 20th century. You know, it's bridging um, this notion of utilitarian pottery with sculpture. It's, um, it has everything to do with color. It has everything to do with um, design, even though I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a designer by trade, it has everything to do with uh, the boundaries between art, craft, and design. And so that needs, uh, there needs to be a network for that brand. Uh, part of that has to be a sort of a social accessibility. Um, I'm on social media, and that is how I market my work and myself. I do that um, by just sharing what I do on a daily basis. Sometimes that means I, I share what happens here at RIT. Uh, sometimes that means that I show how I make things, and sometimes that means I have cup sales. And all of that is part of a marketing experience. Uh, it's part of a chance for people to get to know me um, uh, and get to know the work. But then the other part has to do with a certain sort of exclusivity, which is so the opposite of what you two need. Uh, I know financially I need a certain amount of money to survive, and I also need only a certain amount of money to thrive. I could grow my business to become a million dollar business or a two million dollar, whatever. If you dream it, it will happen, but that will come at the expense of a certain type of exclusivity and inability for people to have the things that I have. It would change the whole social structure of the work, and so it is important to me to, to be hard to get. So to get that thing, you actually need to contact a gallery, and there are a few of those. And um, so I'm in that regard, it's pretty hard to get the hands on the work for the commission. Gary? Is that hard for, two things, is that hard for your students to uh, wrap their head around exclusivity? I think everyone's so afraid of, in the field of craft, uh, in the field of art, they're so afraid of taking the leap and making a business. My primary source of income is my work, not this job. It allows me to, to teach and to teach without fear of losing the teaching job. Uh, but the primary <laughs> source of income is and will always be the work that I make. And it's not, I I in this field, it is very not steady. So I might make a significant amount of money in January and then nothing for four months and then another chunk here and another chunk there. And I think that concept is really hard for people to wrap their heads around. Um, but so many people do it and have done it for so long. Uh, you, did I you had that? No, you had mentioned something in our early conversations before this uh, about a large commission for you could, uh, could potentially ruin your career. Like something big. It's not even just like, can I get your work at Pottery Barn? Which would be awful, right? That's not exclusive at all, I'm assuming. Probably not. Assuming you're probably not able to get it at Pottery Barn. Well, I'm assuming that's that that's what you're talking about in terms of exclusivity. I'm not able to get your work at a mall, but also on the other end, a big project could define you. A very very large project commission could define your work. Right. Sure. Yes. And is that a bad thing? Yes. Why? 
<laughs> this is fascinating. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I want to hear, <laughs> hear Natalie's take on this too afterwards. You know, in a, inappropriately <laughs> pricing something, just as there needs to be a certain set of a sense of exclusivity, if I did sell a piece for, say, $120,000, which is not out of the realm of possibility for someone working in the field of fine art, it's actually not even a stretch, um, that would change the whole structure of how I'm able to price things on the lower end and the accessibility for which everyone can get my work. Right now I still I have I have ways for 18 year olds to have access to the work and ways for you know, for people to have access to different work. You know, but that would doing something like that, there was a, a recent sale of a pot that was forty five thousand dollars and it was, you know, pot like this from a, a, a peer of of mine out there in the world who's doing really well. But that totally changes the person's ability to um, to sell things from that point forward because they all have to sell at that price now there's a tier that they're at yeah there's a there's a space and so they either it's it's like um, it's it's like the Dow it's going up or it's going down you know <laughs> so that's that's a little scary do you, uh, do you find that? I have mixed feelings about that I it's first of all it's fascinating um, and I appreciate, as a human, that you are interested in creating impact on a large scale and therefore maintaining a certain level of accessibility. I feel like it's simply like a branding and marketing challenge to come up with perhaps a tiered approach to say, okay, this is my exclusive line. It's, you know, to use a fashion reference, the difference between BCBG Max Cesaria and BCBG Generation. And so they have a tiered, you know, this is the exclusive line and then this is the accessible, more accessible line for, you know, to use sort of aim towards teenagers. Um, so I feel like it's a, a marketing and branding challenge. I guess my other question is, well, why can't you sell lots of pieces at $120,000? And then perhaps find a different way or a different product to offer at a lower tier or maybe create the impact and experience that you're looking for in a more consumable way at maybe no cost. I don't, you know what I mean? That, that, all, that has to do with scale and the scale of a business. Mm -hmm. That's the third element in this equation. Mm -hmm. I work with my wife. We have this lovely sort of idyllic situation we work together in the studio we spend our time together we had moments where we employed people now we don't mm -hmm. we had moments where we brought in interns now we don't um, we we have scaled the thing to our life to our seven-year-old to our five-year-old and that's where we want to keep it so it's a sustainability mm -hmm. thing and also if if i were to scale the business and do that which right then you you know you're talking about on the upper end now you're starting to talk about a different message um, because in fine art, the, the work needs to sort of take on a different sort of identity when you're talking about $120,000. Um, and then on the lower end, if you're, you know, marketing things for $100 or $50, you need to make them at a manufacturing rate that is the commensurate with the mm -hmm. money that's coming in. Um, uh, so all of that involves scale. All of that involves quitting our IT tomorrow. Um, don't do that. We would don't never do that. kind of that. interested <laughs> in not <laughs> doing it. You know, so it's like okay. it's <laughs> that goes back to that first thing about keeping like everyone thinks you need to you need to make you only need to make what you need to make to survive and then you need to do what you talked about, which is the people that you're uh, working with affecting them in a really strong way. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're almost out of time, and I, but we, I want to leave a few minutes for any questions from the audience. So I've, I've got one last question, and, and please, if you're in the audience, if you have, think about what you might want to ask. But I'm going to switch gears completely uh, and get a little bit on the emotional plane. And um, fear and rejection. How do you deal, I'll start with you, Natalie, <laughs> um, today? I mean, you, you well, I don't know what you might have done in the early part of your career, but now you're, you're, you're well established, all these accolades. Do you still think about rejection, and how do you deal with that? And I would then ask the two of you. I'm still human, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, of course. I mean, fear and rejection are not pleasant feelings for anyone to experience. Um, I have built. I mean, at this point in my career, I'm not. It doesn't feel like the next job could either put me out of business or feed me dinner tomorrow. So there is a certain level of comfort that I didn't have when I was starting out. 
um, I, in some ways I've insulated myself from parts of the sales experience because I still in my soul, my gut reaction is to like give someone a discount simply because I like seeing people smile. Right. And I know that it's not necessarily, it doesn't do anything good for the impact. And I'm, I'm laughing because my first portrait clients are in the back of the room here. Carl, what did I charge you for your son's senior portraits? Like 20 bucks? 20 bucks? <laughs> and it came with dinner for my mom. <laughs> and, and cookies. <laughs> so, um, so you lost money on that deal. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but the, the experience I gained was invaluable. Because right. as right. soon as they handed me the check, they're like, you need to charge a lot more, Natalie. And I was like, oh, well, and they're like, okay, bye. Um, <laughs> so, which was a great lesson. Um, so I don't answer the phone in my studio because, you know, if someone's like, oh, well, you know, maybe they can create a scenario in which I might be inclined to change the price, I'm not on the phone. And my, my studio manager, who's here in the front row, Molly, um, it, she doesn't, it, people know when they're talking to her that she's not the one setting the prices, so no one asks for discounts. Um, so, but it, you know, in a way, at the end of the day, honestly, if someone doesn't want to hire me at my prices, that's completely fine, and it's their decision. And if what I provide to them is not worth what it costs to provide it to them, then they're not my client, and ultimately, they will not receive the same impact on a discounted service that they would at full price. And I know that in my heart and in my gut. But it, it doesn't change that like flight or flight fight or right. flight reaction of like rejection, like. What if they don't like me? <laughs> but if I understand what you're saying, it's not rejection. It's just that this is not a fit. And so, sure. so and, and that's fine because you, love, you yeah. can't be the photographer for everybody. I love finding out that I'm not a good fit for someone. I would love to find out in the beginning of the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> like my favorite thing is yeah. to like turn away a client and feel really good about that. Um, my, my studio manager, one of her first days at the studio, we had a client, I had a wedding meeting with her. Um, we talked about what she wanted and she legitimately, this was the strangest experience, doesn't happen often, but she slid an envelope of cash across the table. It was $6,000 and she said, okay, like, let's do this. And I literally slid it back to her and I said, I don't think I'm a good fit for you. And her jaw dropped and in my head, I'm like, am I crazy? Um, but I knew that we weren't going to be a good fit. I wasn't going to ultimately be able to make her happy. And so I was really like, I felt good about turning that job down. Unmarked bills, of yeah. course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so Gary, you just, you just completed this phenomenal project at the airport. Did you, ever, did you ever fear that you might fail? My fear of rejection comes from, I work for a lot of long-term projects. And there will be times when I'll put my work out there or I'll do a pitch and then I won't hear I'm like, what? So it's like, I don't know. Are they talking about this behind me? It's like, did, you know, it's, it, I'll just, I'll work really hard, put my work out there, and then I'll, it'll be silent for weeks. And I don't know whether it landed well. They just have to sort of figure it out. And it's like, and I won't, the phone won't ring. I won't get an email. They just need to ruin it. And I climb this ladder of inference in my mind. Oh, my God. This, this did not go well. I bombed it. It was terrible. There, this, this was the thing. When I did the concept for the airport, I was leaving for Denmark the next <laughs> week. And it was almost good because I didn't have time to worry about it. So they said, uh, the governor's going to give us, give us um, if we can come up with a cool idea, the governor's giving one of the upstate cities $50 million to do something for their airports. And they said, so we got to come up with a cool idea, and it's due next week. <laughs> so I threw something together, and it was like almost the urgency of it mm -hmm. made me not overthink it. <laughs> so it was like, well, here's what you're doing. Went to Denmark, didn't bring any laptop or anything like that, so I was out. Of th th and I get a phone call in Denmark, and they're like, so they want to know how long, how many linear feet is in this pipe, or how many square footage of that fabric is going to be in it. And I was like, I don't know, but clearly – somebody's interested that's the only way i knew yeah, right. that it was that it landed successfully was they were asking for dimensions <laughs> good sign <laughs> it's like that's a very I good don't sign i know how big this right. thing is you're like did you see the price oh okay <laughs> <laughs> I, like see, I have no idea how big this thing is but the other to your point it's like i have always wanted i work with a lot of actors uh in stage design and um i've always uh really been jealous that they have an agent Mm. because they have someone who can say, nope, they're worth that. Sorry. 
That's good cop, bad cop. But I have to have that relationship with my clients one on one because it's a personal relationship, and I have to be able to say, uh, "It's not worth it for me to do this job," and that's hard. Right. Peter, may I be your agent? <laughs> uh, Peter, totally Peter says, I'm, yeah. Peter, I'm sorry, it's whatever Peter says. It is. Has fear of failure ever crossed your mind, I Peter? Will, yeah, well, I'll get a soup for him. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah fear, fear of failure is a, that's a very real thing. Um, it sort of it, it defined the first six or so postgraduate years <laughs> um, th- as we had this family. Uh, the family grew. I, I was very afraid that the world would figure out that I was a fraud at some point, that the ideas were lame, that the work was awful, and that suddenly it would all just fall out. Um, that was a constant, almost crippling fear for six years. Um, Did it affect your work? It never affected my work because the only way that I can solve that is to to work. That's it. Like, I'm very uh, v- a very intense person, if you... <laughs> If you haven't gathered that already, um, <laughs> and the only a lot of these sort of issues that I have with fear are solved just by the making, and the problem is the work is pretty laborious uh, as a result of that, and then uh, it falls apart because it's pretty risky, and then that becomes its own type of fear. Uh, but now it's only within the last two years I kind of woke up. I was at a person's wedding, actually, uh, on the Fourth of July two years ago. Uh, Katie Welkley, congratulations, Katie, and. Um, uh, I just, I, I, I came, I had just come back from this, this, uh, I taught at Haystack over the summer, and I just said, this is, this is absurd, like, I have these children, L- Lori and I have this thing, and I'm not willing to let it go for anything, and so that, it, it almost that day just stopped it dead. Mm-hmm. I have a fear uh, for the students at RIT that they won't find happiness. Um, and then I feel motivated to help them find that, that they, I want to make sure their careers kind of move forward. I have a fear that I won't always get to work, be able to work, work in the studio, but I have no fear the rest of it is gone. And, th- and then that seems strange and idyllic again, but I just don't have, I don't have the mental space to take it on. I had to let mm. it go. Great, great. So let me pause here. Are there any questions uh, in the audience? Anybody have a question they would like to ask? Can, since we're small enough, you could probably just belt out your, your question. So in this case, it was a, it was, it was a complete uh, – I had all this research that I had done for um, – biomimicry research to introduce the county owns the airport and they don't know what biomimicry is so (laughs) so biomimicry is a new is new to them but it's old to us in terms of buildings that are matching the way organisms build themselves Um, we're now building architecture that way because we can with 3d printers and computers we don't need to make everything so linear right and so that was an education process for them and it was you can it, 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 if anybody remembers what it was before that it's very linear like uh airport and it was it's like we're basically proposing a very organic structure on top of this and that you don't you would crumble under the weight if you thought about that in the design process <laughs> i would if i if i were honest with you and if i had thought about if I had thought what you had just asked, I may not have done the project. I would be like, oh, I didn't know this was going to be a thing. And it, and there's all these. So I look at like Albert Paley's work and I think, you know, um, if he were known to be, if this was going to be an icon, I don't know whether he would, um, he, maybe he's more confident than I am, but he, he might, he, the stress would crumble me like I would crush to say, oh, wow, this is going to be this big of a deal. I can't work that way. I just have to work like, what would be super fun to do? <laughs> like, let's <laughs> do something cool. And that's why, uh, listen, people hire an architectural concept artist if they know they're shooting for the moon. Like, you don't, if you know what your building are going to look like, you're not going to hire me. And it's, so you want to hire me because you're looking for something weird, 
right? And it's so it's like I I only only two percent of my projects get built because they're out there, and that's fine. So when I'm doing a project, I swore the airport was never going to get built. I was like, I went to Denmark. I was like, there's no way this is going to happen. There's no way they're not going to do this. And then that's the only, you know when they call. It happens. If I had worried about it too much, I would have freaked out and I would have probably quit the job <laughs> under the stress of, oh, man, this is too big. You know? <laughs> well, we're glad you did it because it's really cool. Um, any other questions? I see a hand. Okay, please. Question, girl. <laughs> um, no, that's a great question. I think avoiding that situation is the best <laughs> solution to it. And so through educating your client as to w what they should expect and then delivering what you said you were going to deliver, thankfully I've avoided that situation in, in most of my clients. Um, I think the other, the other thing is, is that I open up the avenue for feedback while I'm shooting. And so my, my standard spiel that I give without even thinking now when I pick up my camera is, okay, great, so you did a great job preparing for your shoot. I'm gonna take care of everything from here. I'm gonna tell you how to pose, where to stand, what to do. I'm gonna show you photos in the back of the camera while we're shooting. That's your opportunity to give me any feedback you'd like. We can change anything while we're shooting. Just let me know and be honest with me. My whole team was like, yep, I've heard that a gajillion times. <laughs> um, and so, that's when I want the feedback, and that's pretty much the only time that we're open to it. Maybe once a year, maybe, we have a client who's disappointed after we've done the shoot, but we spend so much time on the front end of that, talking to the client, getting their input, and then tailoring this experience to them in a custom way, and getting feedback while it's happening, that luckily we're able to avoid that. Because that's a sticky situation, and that's actually... I love, I love where your head's at in terms of, okay, this is something I experienced at school. How does it translate in the real world? That's a phenomenal question. You hope it doesn't, basically. <laughs> critique, client critique. Critique. Everyone critiques everyone. Everyone judges everyone. That is the world in which we live. Um, <laughs> you know, and critique as a student, it's a very complicated thing, right? And when you start to imagine going out into the world and, and facing critique, it's, it's daunting. Um, there are, of course, um, critical thinkers, critical minds that write all the time about exhibitions and whatnot and tend to tear people up. Um, there are the fans that love you on Instagram. There are the people that strongly dislike everything you do. There's a world of people who, m who make judgments on anyone's work in the fine art, uh, sculpture, craft world. Um, <coughs> I've found that we have to be really receptive to the difference between what the classroom offers and what the world offers. And that one of the great things by um, uh, that you've gained, that anyone has gained through going through a university has been um, gaining a type of familiarity with a faculty or with a collection of faculty that you would not otherwise have access to if you say just uh, had a go of it on your own. And so it's in that very safe environment that critical discourse happens because people get to know you as a student. That is very important and it's not always comfortable. We leave that environment, we go to the world and it becomes very dangerous because people's critique becomes subjective and it becomes in relationship to the way that they uh, see the world or the way that their career works. That's dangerous. Um, dangerous when people tell you that they love your work equally to when they, when they don't necessarily. Um, so you have to create a network of people that you trust out there and you only listen to that um, and, and you, you kind of covet that. Um, there's a gal, Christina West, who, uh, who I believe to be one of the great um, figure sculptors alive right now. She's one of the four. There are many more than four, but in my mind I'm one of the great four. Anyway, anything she says, positively or negatively, it means the world to me, and I, I search it out. 
and she would never give it to me unless she thought I was in a position to accept it. So you have to kind of, it, it's so different. And then, you know, if you are in school still, you have to think about that luxury that you have to have those sorts of conversations, however difficult, um, while you have the time in, in school. Two things for me is um, y train yourself in school to uh, do blind critiques where you're just putting your work out there and you're not defending it and you're just seeing how it lands because a lot of times that's how it's going to be in the real world is you don't get to explain it, how it's going to be experienced. It just gets experienced. And the more you can train yourself in school to have that experience where you just put it out there mm -hmm. and not be representing it yourself is um, really powerful. But also, like, I had to find a, a cl friendships, professional, semi-professional relationships, friendships for me, w who would be honest with me. And I reward those relationships like you would not believe. Because they'll, if, if LeBron doesn't have somebody who's saying, me, you're being a uh, moron. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's like, if you, you see all kinds of superstars that don't have, that all, all they have is yes people around them. Mm -hmm. And respect that person who's gonna give you honest thing and just reward that like crazy. Because I have, if I have a client who, or a, friend who's going to be like that's not your best work but here's why uh oh man that's important to me and they're they i love what you said they do it in a way that they know i'm able to receive it that's very important if we have a relationship where i respect it and i know that it's not necessarily just that they're in a bad mood it's not subjective and oh, it's it's so valuable to me for that. As the only non-creative on the <laughs> panel here, the the only the only phrase that comes to mind, and it's a little bit of a stretch, but I would say, life's unfair, get over it. <laughs> we have time for one last question. <laughs> That's how he In the back. <laughs>That's a great question. Um, so, and you're a photographer, I take it? Uh, yeah, cool. Um, so th that is fairly s a, a specific experience to my work in that my work pretty much looks on the back of the camera 90% of the way it's gonna look once we edit. I'm not really big into editing. Um, I have a team that does it and it does get done. However, it doesn't change the essence of the image. And I'm also very careful about the images that I show to my clients on the back of the camera. Um, every time I'm training a new photographer, I say, you live and die by the first photo you show on the back of the camera. If you pick the wrong one, the shoot's kind of over because you have so much trust to rebuild. So I make sure that I knock it out of the park and I show them an image that's going to wow them. Because with my clients, I do portrait work. The insecurity they have is not about me as an artist. It's about them as a human and how they look. And so for me, I'm simply showing them, hey, you look good. And so it isn't about the photo, it's about how they are being photographed. So that is certainly a little bit of a, a difference in what I do. If you're an incredibly, you know, if you're into um, doing a lot in editing where it changes the whole mood of the, the photo, then I would say don't show on the back of the camera. Um, that's just what works really well for me in my studio. I can tell you the, the, the airport is blue because I showed a client the blue it's the default, that blue piping is the default material I had on the 3D model. And then they went to press with it. And then the county became really freaked out that they could change, they're not, we can't change the color, it went, it's in the newspapers. It's like, so it was like, <laughs> I, and it's, it's like, I, I gotta, I'm very, very careful about what I show a client in yeah. terms of process work and how it's gonna land. And I had no, I did not anticipate that they would be like, this is, no, th 
the, <laughs> listen, they would they went out there and now it's got to be blue. So I see that and I'm like, oh, it's so blue. <laughs> it's like the <laughs> default 3D blue. <laughs> like that's why it ended up that way. Mm -hmm. But on the converse of that is with my students, I want to see every single iteration of their work. And it's not realistic when you get out in the world to do that. But I'm doing it as a relationship with them to see their process. But man, it, for a client work, I'm very s pretty selective about what I'm going to show them so that they don't get the wrong impression mm -hmm. ahead of time. And it, it could si it could rail like totally sidetrack the entire project. Um, I have a dream. <laughs> I you know I've, I the only I only function with images on Instagram and I am not a photographer I'm not even close to a photographer um, I was only um, I was encouraged to join Instagram uh, from someone who said that nobody understood how I made the work I made and so I needed to take process pictures and back in the day when I was young and it was two years ago before the algorithm um, you know that you would post a picture and it would happen in real time. Um, and it would it would uh, it would be real. You would just take it on your phone, and it would crop it to a square, and it would go. And then all of a sudden, they changed the structure, and it was no longer in real time. And that's when everyone started taking photographs and then editing them like crazy, and then putting them on Instagram. And whereas I don't have this uh, a, a client experience, I've never made something blue that has ended up. To become an airport, um, I would <laughs> say that like we have to start to become, we have to find a way to come back a little bit from editing software and to, uh, at least in the way that we're uh, um, sharing images, we need to have a little more realism <laughs> in the way that we share our life experience, our images. Um, that's specific to social media. Well, I, I'd say on that note, um, I hope you found this conversation as fascinating as I did. And would you please join me in, in thanking Natalie, Gary, and Peter for just uh, some wonderful thoughts and insights. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Stephen. We'll, we will yeah. see you. Um, we, we'll, we hope to continue this series. It won't occur until next semester, but uh, that's our intention. So thank you again for coming out, and uh, have a great evening. Thank, thank you. you, Steve.